Welcome to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, a podcast about the United States and the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm your host, Michael Patrick Cullinane. Welcome back to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. If you watch Julian Fellow's The Gilded Age TV show, or if you're a student of the period, you have almost certainly heard about Mrs. Astor. One of my first guests on the show, Professor Cecilia Tishy, she wrote a book called What Would Mrs. Astor Do? And it was a study of the era's ethics and mores, especially in New York City, where the wealthy socialites like Caroline Astor set the tone for high society. And if you saw the television show, you'll also know that high society's rules bend for the rich who had not yet broken in. And that on the outskirts of this self-selecting club of elite were a number of outliers and social pariahs. Today, we are not going to be talking much about Mrs. Astor. Instead, we're talking about an outsider. To be honest, I think the outsiders are more fun anyway. Today, I'm joined by Betsy Priolo. She's the author of Diamonds and Deadlines, a tale of greed, deceit, and a female tycoon in the Gilded Age. This is an incredible story. It's rare on these shows that I get to talk about menage a trois, but we're going to get into that today. It's a story of Miriam Leslie, and I'm going to let Betsy introduce her properly. What I'll do simply is say is that Betsy is a magnificent historian of society norms, sex, gender, and culture. She taught literature at Manhattan College and later at NYU, and her first book, Swoon, Great Seducers and Why Women Love Them, asks the age-old question, what do women want? And why are some men good at love and seduction and others not? Now, I have not read this book, but it is most certainly on my reading list. Her second book I have read, it's called Seductress, Women Who Ravish the World and the Lost Art of Love. This is also a must read about famous women who use sex and charm to achieve their goals. Let me just say that Betsy does not write boring books and Diamonds and Deadlines keeps with this trend. I'm delighted to welcome to the show, Welcome Betsy. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here, Michael. Thank you. So I've got the book here, Diamonds and Deadlines. It is, uh, it's very exciting because this is a personality that I have not heard about before. It's brand new and it was a riveting read. So can you just tell us, just kick things off. Imagine no one knows, like I didn't know it at the time of reading, who is Miriam Leslie and how is it that we've not heard about her already? Yeah, it's just, One of the great mysteries of American history. She has been totally forgotten. She's on none of the roll calls of famous American women. She draws a blank everywhere. And yet, uh, during the Gilded Age, she was a national celebrity. She was the most famous woman in America. She's a phenomenon. I mean, when women were confined to the private sphere, denied autonomy, denied financial independence, denied equality. Uh, She ran the largest publishing company in America for 20 years on cutthroat male turf. Uh, She steered the Frank Leslie Publishing Company to nationwide superiority and made a fortune she was a brilliant businesswoman. And um, on top of all of that, I, she made a fortune. She left in a surprise bombshell legacy her $2 million fortune, equivalent to about $50 million today, to women's suffrage, and literally rescued the movement when it was fractured and circling the drain. And why she's on none of the the celebrations of great feminists and saviors of the women's vote, I don't know. It's a real mystery. I've got some theories, but it is a conundrum. Well, we're here now. I I suppose the the main thing is that we finally have the biography. I I was just curious to know how you came to find her and and what, you know, because she brushed shoulders with so many people, maybe some people that you had written about before. How did you come to meet Miriam Leslie in your own work? Yeah, I, she makes a cameo appearance in an earlier book of mine, Seductress. And that book was about women who had full entitlement in their lives. They managed to succeed professionally, uh, 
and erotically and in their own private life. But uh, when I went back to look at her little bio in that book, uh, I realized that there was something amiss. It didn't fit together. And the other thing I realized is why when the centennial of the 19th Amendment rolled around, she was left out. So that's what prompted me to go back to her story. Turns out the person who had written the original biography in 1952 had bought into Miriam's official biography. Miriam reinvented herself and marketed through her press a, a completely false narrative about herself. So it, the biographer had reproduced that and that's what started the long dig into the real truth behind Miriam Wesley's fantastic life. Well, I guess that's a good starting place is her upbringing because you, in the book, you talk about how she fabricated this upbringing that she had. And so I, I wonder if you can tell us about it. I mean, like, what's the true story and, and what's the one that we best suspect to be her true parentage? And because there's, there's some controversy there too. There's a story she told the world, there's the probably true story, and then there is the other story, right? So what's going on? Yeah, all right. Oh, it's, it's a fantastic, uh, incredible adventure story, really. Um, she told the world that she was a high-born aristocrat from an ancient Huguenot family raised between a plantation in Louisiana and a New Orleans mansion and nursed by a, quote, dear old mammy. Her mother, she said, was a proper Bostonian lady who schooled her in, you know, genteel graces. And her father, uh, a rich cotton broker, was a highly cultivated man who trained her in the, quote, tenants of old aristocracy. Well, the whole story was a complete falsehood. It turns out that she was, she had a very, very hard knock, disheveled background. Once you dig into the records, you'll find that she was born illegitimate in 1836, almost certainly uh, the daughter of one of her father's enslaved women. And I got really lucky. Uh, there was a researcher here in Charleston who actually found a list of the possible candidates, which was, uh, you know, <laughs> it was an incredible find. So there was even at the time uh, an eyewitness, her stepsister who was there on the premises said, Oh, there was no question. Everybody knew she was the daughter of, in those days, they said, Negro uh, slave. So all the evidence points in that direction. In addition to that, um, her father was a, a real mess. He was a bounder, a bankrupt, absentee. Um, she was completely neglected, except that he wrote her letters encouraging her to excel in school, which was his only plus. And he lived with his common law wife, Susan, who, quote, kept a parlor house for gentlemen, no questions asked. So she was a procurist, almost certainly. So they led a pillar to post existence before they got to New York City. And around 1852, when Miriam was 16, she lost her means of support. There was a charitable uncle up there who had been funding her for a couple of years. And the opportunities then for women were incredibly slim. Um, you could make 20, no, 75 cents a week for brutal piecework, or you could make as much as $5 a night for sex work. 
So Miriam changed her name to Minnie. Uh, this is substantiated. She changed her name to Minnie and began attending what they had in New York then were called public balls. There were many of these each night for the purpose. And her brother wrote her and said, I see that you are well up in the market and named several candidates and said, I think you will be worth now um, as much as $12,000 if you keep up like this. So she was doing quite well. But it went on like this because Lola Montez entered the scene. She trained her for the stage. This was another sort of scuzzy uh, part of her life because women who were actresses then were social outcasts. And there she became the mistress of William Churchwell and so on. Um, that led, of course, to a marriage to this guy, E.G. Square. And a menage a trois, and so on. <laughs> so, oh, let's unpack all of this. There's so much going on there. Let's I didn't mean off. to overwhelm you with all of that. <laughs> oh, it is. I mean, the story is completely overwhelming. We've we've only scratched the surface here. I mean, you um, really, I really have. <laughs> Lola Montez. I mean, she is one of the biggest celebrities of this period. She is a celebrity dancer. She's not only someone who schools Miriam in, you know, the ways of seduction, perhaps, but she's also she's also a great benefactor. I mean, how does she transform Miriam's life? Well, it it turned out that Miriam was really at the very, very end of her resources. Um, after, it's a complicated story, but she had engineered a shotgun marriage. And after that, there was a crackdown on prostitution in New York. And she and her mother were in the depths of poverty. All of a sudden, Lola Montez appeared on the scene because Miriam's stepbrother had just committed suicide over Lola. He had a turret affair and cast himself off a boat. So Lola had had a conversion experience and decided to atone for that by adopting Miriam as her, quote, sister. She uh, trained her for the stage for an East Coast tour and included lessons in seduction. Now, Lola was the past mistress of seduction. <laughs> she uh, had written a book on this subject. She had conquered all the, the titled heads of Europe. Um, there were su other suicides besides Miriam's half-brother. It was an extraordinary career. Um, she was a self-made woman, also illegitimate, also from Ireland. And... Um, her influence on Miriam was extraordinary. She did a total makeover. She taught her how to dress, how to uh, handle her presence on stage, um, how to be fascinating. The art of fascination was Lola's specialty of the house. And she passed that on to Miriam. So all of a sudden, her life was completely transformed, and um, Lola actually willed Miriam all of her money, and then Lola was quite wealthy. And you mentioned a menage a trois, and I don't think I get a lot of uh, chances to talk about menage a trois on the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, uh, because we maybe sometimes think of uh, this this period as somewhat Victorian, but. I, at the center of the book is this menage a trois. And you've got to tell us about Frank Leslie and E.G. Square, uh, because they seem to be, I mean, this, this menage a trois is going on as the country is tearing itself apart. And it seems like these three are fighting a, a civil war all of their own in lust and in, you know, possession of each other. And tell us about their relationship, because it seems so central to the book. Yeah, this was really a fraught relationship. Uh, Miriam had married an unfortunate man. Uh, E.G. Square was a prominent anthropologist, but his tastes were a little bizarre. He married her partly because he preferred women with a, quote, tinge of color. And he also had a penchant for, um, for, for 
native boy, boys. And he also drank a lot. He was very much a misogynist. And she had some difficult times with him. But at a crucial point, Frank Leslie, who was then the absolute uh, king of the publishing world, uh, entered the scene. He founded Illustrated Journalism in America and was then quite wealthy, quite famous. He was handsome. He was rich. He was a, quote, fireballer. And the minute he met Miriam, he just fell head over heels in love with her and left his wife and two children and moved in with the squares. Uh, the idea was that he was going to save the money um, by paying part of the rent. Well, it turned out uh, he and Miriam shared adjacent bedrooms and <laughs> went off to the theater together and would leave E.G. in the middle of the park, just as a joke, and drive off again. E.G. was building up a huge head of steam at this point and got angrier and angrier. At the, when they also took stolen weekends while E.G. sat at home or E.G. made field trips to Peru or whatever. At any rate, at the end, uh, E.G. really lost it and was wielding guns and threatening to kill himself, kill them. And Miriam was able to divorce him, which was really a difficult uh, trick for a woman then. She had to produce clear proof of adultery. And of course, divorced women were social pariahs. But anyway, there was that tremendous adultery sting where she got um, E.G. invited to a grand dinner at a, at a temple of Venus, as they call them, disguised as an elegant brownstone. And they got him, the, the, the lady boarders, a gypsy in Indiana, got him completely drunk and led him upstairs and then enter the illustrators from Frank Leslie's Weekly <laughs> who, who, who sketched him nude on the chair with these naked women at his feet. So, uh, she was able to get him to sign the papers the next day, but it was all quite a sordid episode, the whole menage a trois, and it lasted 10 years. That's the incredible part. Uh, it sounds like he doesn't go away entirely either. It sounds like Square remains a part of her life uh, as a nuisance sometimes, and uh, but but always there until his death. Well, she thought she'd gotten rid of him forever. After the divorce, he ended up in a mental asylum. People attributed that to her cruelty for divorcing him. But in point of fact, it was probably, I'd forgotten which stage, maybe stage two or three syphilis. At any rate, um, she thought he was carefully locked away in this mental institution, but he promised when he signed the papers that he would take his revenge. And sure enough, uh, two years later, the Nevada paper, the Territorial Enterprise, this is where Mark Twain worked. It had nationwide circulation. Um, he wrote a, com a complete expose of her life. Uh, the years of prostitution, what her mother had done, and uh, the whole menage a trois business. So um, he did uh, strike back in a way that Miriam never suspected. So we've also had the, the other character here that is so important, and that's Frank Leslie, who in some ways is Miriam's savior and kind of the because she, she's eventually going to take over the business as well. But I think if you could just tell us a little bit about Frank Leslie's business, because he is a real pioneer in the 1870s. And, and this is a time, too, that you rightly point out that the economy is collapsing and Frank Leslie's rising. But he's got quite an up and down career, doesn't he? I mean, it's not all highs. There's a lot of lows with him as well, right? Right, right. Um, he was a, a great, as I said, he was a great... Uh, newspaper czar. He ran the largest publishing company in America. And as I said, he brought illustrated journalism to America. He really revolutionized the industry just to set the background. Um, he invented 
uh, something called divisible blocks, where you could produce an engraving in a day instead of a week. And he also introduced graphic, sensationalistic stories that appeal to the widest popular audience. That had never been done before. Um, he is especially famous for something called his Swill Milk Campaign, where he exposed this terrific uh, scam in New York where the poor were being not sold real milk. But um, he was one of these gigantic figures in the Gilded Age. It was always, I want it more, more, bigger, better, all the time. So he had this expansionist idea about his, his empire. So he kept buying more and more journals, putting out this, that, and the other thing. And he essentially overextended. At one point, he, he almost ended up in jail because he published something called The Day's Doings, which was a very naughty tabloid. And Anthony Comstock came after him and he just, he escaped by a hair. He happened to know somebody um, in the Justice Department in New York, got off. At any rate, so this expansion thing kept going and he wasn't paying attention. There was um, a, a recession, a depression, and he kept on buying and buying. and he came back from this very extravagant tour across the United States to find that he was completely bankrupt. He lost everything. He lost the entire company. And he then became an employee of a group of, of administrators. The, in, the most horrible humiliation you could think of. And then died while he was still in hock to these people. So it was Miriam uh, who was the real hero here because she rescued the company uh, when it was really going down for the third time. And she has her own innovations with publishing as well. I mean, tell us a little bit about what she brings to the party because when even when Frank is alive, she's contributing to how the newspapers and magazines develop, right? Right. Yeah, she, she pitched... Her magazine, she ran, when, when Frank Leslie first hired her, she ran uh, a magazine called The Ladies Magazine. This was a monthly that had been devoted to uh, a lot of uh, Civil War stories and sentimental poetry. And she turned it completely around and made it a fashion magazine. She figured that women, uh, she, she foresaw the future, the post-bellum future, where women were going to be consumers, where people were going to be in a money-getting, money-spending mood. And so she became the fashion, fashion maven uh, of her time and tastemaker. So she began to produce the kind of literature that the middle class front parlor women wanted to read. She just had an ear to what people wanted to read. So there were stories of, you know, chivalric women, uh, chivalric women and men, um, and a lot of pink lens, fiction and poetry and mostly advice columns about how to run a house. Meanwhile, Miriam herself was very anti-domestic, but pragmatically she understood uh, that this is what made the mule plow. This is what was going to pull in leaves. And over and over again, she was able to uh, brag about fabulous uh, circulation numbers because people wanted to be um, taken out of the Civil War. They were tired of it. They wanted to look forward uh, to a new world of spectatorship, of carnival, of the Gilded Edge. <laughs> Absolutely. And she is at the kind of coal phase, I think in part because she's 
personally challenging some of the social and gender norms at the time as well, it seems like. So uh, Frank was charged, you mentioned there, with uh, obscenity because one of his uh, magazines printed stories that were they were too racy or they were kind of like early personal ads or something like that, right? Right, um, right. But how does this affect their chances of rising through New York society? Because there's this hierarchy at the time in the Gilded Age, and yet there's this, there's this, w- w- the role of women is changing, as you say, you know, they're, they're becoming consumers, fashion is important, gender is sort of, gender norms are, are, they're breaking down a little bit, although we're nowhere near the 1920s, but I mean, she's she herself is breaking down gender norms, isn't she? She is, but she's doing it subversively. Because uh, what the way she succeeded was by using the master's tools to invade the master's house. That's to say, she she adopted the persona of the ideal patriarchal lady. And beneath that mask, that facade, she operated as a really transgressive, futuristic woman. She, uh, for example, at work, she adopted the guise of the porcelain Southern girl. She wore tight black satin gowns with organy aprons, and she'd greet men in a musical contralto, you know, with a raven quill. Uh, Men were completely disarmed by their own weapons. Uh, They didn't suspect this hard knuckle commander at the controls who wielded a typewriter and ran this company like a field marshal. So she was uh, was kind of a, a a Trojan horse operator. I mean, on the surface, she appeared to be um, one of the typical model Victorian ladies um, who were mandated at the time. But actually, uh, beneath the surface, she was uh, using the privileges of her sex and the gallantry of men uh, to get her way. Um, I don't do, know if you saw the television show, The Gilded Age, Julian Fellows' new show. Yes, of course I did. Well, there's a character in the show called Sylvia Chamberlain, and she's she's kind of one of the main characters, but she's excluded from society because of her relationship with her husband. And it pre, you know, they had a relationship that predated their marriage. Some say the character is based on Arabella Huntington, uh, yes. who you also mentioned in your book as well. But I reckon it quite nicely fits Miriam. I mean, you have to tell us a little bit more about some of the other love affairs that she has that are racy. There's Joachim Miller, who is the famous poet and writer, uh, and there's others still. So tell us about, I mean, she's a great seductress, isn't she? Yeah, she re- she really was. Well, of course, she she studied with the, the master, Lola Montez. She She wasn't pretty, uh, and I think that's really important to emphasize. Um, She had a Roman nose, bulb eyes, and a thin, wide-drawn mouth. Of course, she did have the uh, ideal Victorian uh, figure, you know, this hourglass, um, full bust, a waist that could be spanned by a necklace, and so on. But um, she was dynamite with men. I mean, she really could get and keep these men. Not that she made the right choices because she didn't always, but she was what they called then a free luster. That's to say, these were women who were completely condemned, um, although nobody guessed what was going on beneath the surface. Again, uh, 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 she lived in the shadowlands of the of the Victorian prudish uh, world that we're familiar with. So here she is, finally married to <laughs> um, Frank Leslie. Uh, lots of pomp and circumstance, the one true love of her life. Well, not uh, even less than a year later, she's in the thick of an affair with Joachim Miller the Byron of the Rockies. This is a a very famous poet at the time, a flamboyant, uh, swashbuckling uh, poseur is the best way to put it. 
And that affair lasted 30 years on and off. But he wasn't the only one. Um, as soon as Frank Leslie died, she was mixed up with a whole throng of men. She was uh, engaged for years, uh, engaged is in quotes because they were having an affair with this fellow named the um, Marquis de Louville, <laughs> an incredible character, not a marquis, but he fought several duels over her, which was <laughs> something that impressed her a lot. And then there was a Rus Russian prince, Prince Aris George Aristophe de Gouri, and uh, rumored affairs with lots of others. Uh, Albert Pulitzer was one. He was Joseph Pulitzer's brother, who was a bon vivant and quite handsome and an author of romantic novels, which he would have liked. And then at one point, there was a Louisiana, quote, pretty boy uh, she installed in her apartment building. And she paid his bills when he got arrested because he had compromising diaries about their relationship. So she had many, many uh, affairs. That, that's just skimming the surface. But all through her life, she continued to have men revolving around her. And then at the very end, I don't know whether we want to skip there yet, but she really made the biggest catch of her life. She became engaged to a genuine marquee, um, this uh, Spanish uh, gentleman in waiting to King Alfonso. Um, and he was almost her fifth husband and died just before the wedding. Well, I mean, to have five husbands in this period just seems absurd because we don't hear stories about wealthy aristocratic women. And she was an aristocrat. I mean, that's the other thing, too, that struck me so much about her life is that even, you know, in the 1880s, I mean, I suppose just after uh, Frank Leslie dies in 1880, I think it is. And, and just yeah. after. Yeah, you, you call her the the uh, the queen of Park Place, which I think is great. I mean, she is rushing shoulders with all of the uh, uh, the sort of upper echelon of New York society. In 1882 or 1883, you talk about she threw this party where it would have been worth like $8 million in today's money. And the champagne was like $2 million on its own. No, no, no. Miriam Leslie wasn't there. That was the saddest part of her life is that she wanted desperately to be accepted by high society. There was no way they were going to accept her. It was a ridiculous reach. She was, you know, a triple divorcee, a woman in the professions with a very uncertain pedigree. Nobody knew who she was. Even though she was so successful, so rich, she was the sixth richest woman in America. And yet she continued to be frozen out by high society, by the Astor-led elites. I mean, that was a hopeless reach for her. But um, that party you're talking about was really central in Gilded Age because Alva Vanderbilt, another uh, Aravist, a person from nowhere, uh, breached uh, the Astor circle by sheer force of her chutzpah and incredible wealth. Um, she built the biggest mansion in all of New York and then gave a housewarming party that had never been equal in America. It was just, uh, uh, I mean, uh, out of sight. Uh, the opulence had never been equaled in America. What happened was that um, the Astors still shunned the Vanderbilts. They were still, um, you know, uh, undesirable in every respect, uh, crude, vulgar upstarts. But um, Alva got around that by designing this elaborate quadrille uh, that was going to be the centerpiece of the party. And he had Astor's daughter, um, who became friendly with her daughter, uh, learning the part. So every day you have little Astor <laughs> Caroline Jr. I've gotten what her name was. But anyway, she was busy uh, doing all these steps, learning all the 
the parts for that. But then no invitation to the party arrived. So that put, <laughs> so Mrs. Astor said that that has to be some mistake to Alva. Said, I'm sorry, we haven't been introduced. And then within the hour, the Astor footman arrived with a card. And that was the handing over of the keys to the kingdom, the old 400 to the new order, the new order of Nouveau Riche, who are really taking over the world. It's a wonderful story. It's the one that's sort of, I think it's the one that's told in the uh, the Gilded Age television show as well with, <clears throat> although they're not called the Vanderbilts, I think we know that a Ava Vanderbilt is really the the, the character there and uh, right. and the Astors well, you're, are. You, you're right though, uh, Miriam, uh, Miriam managed to produce the only real sketches of the event. She, her, her reporters were allowed, in, and this was also a breakthrough that had never happened before. Reporters weren't asked to these events, but Alva uh, figured it out. <laughs> it's a it's a brilliant story, and I think you're you know you you end that section by saying that New York society was changed for good after that that party, and it does sound like it. Although it also does sound like your you know your your main character Miriam she doesn't she doesn't get in any further. Um, but does she care? I mean, does she, is that something that she wanted after Frank is dead? I mean, does she care about getting into that set? Yeah, you know, it's really, it's sad. It was an obsession with her. It was all about reparation. I mean, you've got to see where she came from. I mean, an illegitimate biracial girl raised in desperate poverty who had overcome staggering obstacles to get where she was, you can understand that that would be her ultimate dream, the imprimatur of society with capital S. And she couldn't get it out of her system. I mean, she has to have realized how stupid it was to keep butting her head against this, this closed door. And yet she did uh, over and over again. She said to be out of society is to be uh, out of life itself. And so she did everything she could. She adopted um, a, a British accent. She wore all wore clothes. She started an alternate Thursday salon for the literati and the cultural elite. She tried so hard to impress them and she went abroad every summer to sort of varnish her image with continental gloss. The whole idea was to make herself acceptable to them. And it never happened. But she got her revenge, she thought, at the end of her life because she she reinvented herself as the Baroness de Bezus, uh, based on a bogus descent from a 18th century Huguenot noble. Um, and she stamped B on all of her possessions and adopted a coat of arms. By the way, you could buy these coats of arms at Tiffany's. They had a whole book and the, and the nouveau riche would go to Tiffany's and just pick one out, invent, uh, invent a, an ancestry for themselves. And so she basically did what other people were doing. It's just that she decided she would be a French baroness. Uh, actually, I went to Bezus and there were only 40 residents and they've never had any. <laughs> Any title at all <laughs> in their long, long history. Any baron. She's got this connection with Europe, though, too, doesn't she? I mean, she's over there quite a bit, even before she's trying to cultivate this fake, uh, uh, titled background. I mean, she seems like she was well traveled all of her life, whether it was between New Orleans and New York as a as a as a young person. But in Europe, she seems to find herself, or is it is it maybe that she can create a new kind of, uh, she's this American character who, when abroad, she can be whoever she wants. But there's a comfort there, isn't there, in Europe? Exactly. That's why so many of the new fortunes went to Europe, because they were more accepted there. I know it seems strange because the hierarchies were more rigid, but Americans had more money, let's face it. I mean, they came over. Um, uh, and there was the cash for coronets, uh, fed. And so rich Americans were treated better. Also in 
Paris especially then, um, the, it, the, the moral atmosphere was, as you say, it was more lax. Um, the strictures were not as puritanical. Um, Miriam could spread her wings there. She was also fluent in French. This was, she was fluent in four languages, actually, which made traveling abroad easier for her. But um, it, it was a place where women, especially, uh, could could experience uh, a, a, a kind of life, a richness of life. Well, Henry James, of course, writes a lot about that, a richness of experience that was denied them in America. And he enjoyed that too. But he also liked sort of hobnobbing with the, the people who were, I wouldn't say high society in France because they would exclude her too, but the sort of semi-nobility there. Um, and she actually hired a friend who was an American, but who had married a, a baron and circulated among those people. So it was a very sophisticated group that she uh, frequent, frequented. And she knew Sarah Bernhardt. And of course, she was intimate with the wilds in Europe. So she has a quite a continental side to her personality, which, which I think makes her even more interesting. I mean, she was, for all of her, walls and for all, for all of her checkered career, I mean, she was kind of a remarkable human being. I mean, she was an author of six books, a translator, and one of the major influences of her day, but, but also a, quite, a, quite a sophisticated continental figure who, um, who knew a lot of, lot of interesting Europeans. So what do you think her legacy is then? Because she's lived this incredible life and, you know, we can see so many successes and some failures as well. But what are we left with when we look back at Miriam Leslie? Well, I, 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 I was left with the idea that even though there are lots of reasons to dislike her, I mean, she was bigoted. She was hard boiled. She was egocentric. And, and you can pick her apart. Um, a, as much as you want, and you don't have to actually like her. But I think uh, she was uh, a person who really uh, prefigured the future for women. She wanted full entitlements for women. She, and that's not popular right now. There are lots of, of issues uh, that are controversial now her Machiavellian roots of power, her, um, her emphasis on the, the, the advantages of seduction, either in your private or your public life. Um, and she was quite critical of many of the, of the strategies of the feminists then. But um, at the same time, she's, inspirational too, I think, to women. I mean, women still don't have full parity uh, at work. And she had some very cool ideas about how they could get ahead. She thought that they could be a lot more courageous. She said, essay new paths, she would say. Um, her ego, I mean, there's a confidence gap in, in the world today, in women, especially in business. And, you know, she had an ego as big as the Ritz. She believed in having a giant, you know, iron cast selfhood. And I think that's still not a bad, um, not a bad idea. Uh, also, she, as an executive, she was quite savvy. I mean, she had 400 male employees all who adored her. And you could call that Teflon power, soft power, or, or, or charm offensive or whatever, but it worked. You know, I mean, when all of the other companies in New York were on strike and there was a small strike in her company, she walked upstairs and, and, and looked at them and said, how can you do this to a, 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 a widow um, whose husband adored you? 
and I adore you, and that kind of thing. Um, so she was rather shrewd operative when it came to uh, succeeding in the business world. She also was a really, really uh, good manager. I mean, she was panoptic in the way she ran the company. So I think she would have that uh, to um, aid women today. So I think her legacy is that of a kind of a, a proto-feminist. I wouldn't say she's the perfect feminist because she insisted on a sort of retro idea that you know women should have men at their feet and if they didn't, they couldn't be happy and that sort of thing. But at the same time, uh, some of her ideas are, are still viable, I think. And uh, I ended up uh, with a sort of backhanded admiration for her, yet I tried to be as objective as possible too, because you, you can't look away from some of her reactionary views and her racist comments and uh, that sort of thing. She disidentified with wretchedness because she herself had grown up with so much of it. That's just classic, but it still sticks in your craw. You hate to read that sort of thing. But as I said, it, it, the net is that she was another one of these gigantic Gilded Age personalities. And if she were a man, I wondered if he could be quite so tough on her, you know? I mean, a man could have these affairs, a man could, you know, uh, uh, manipulate her, their way to, to his way to uh, a fortune. And the robber barons seem to get a pass. I'm pretty sure we would have had a book about Miriam Leslie if she if she had been Martin Leslie. You know, I, I'm pretty sure that would have been the case. <laughs> I've got I've got a question for you that is not about Miriam so much, but is about your process. Um, on the show, we've talked to a couple of narrative history authors, you being one of them now. And one of the things that I've I've always wondered is, you know, your craft. How how do you go about writing? I mean, because you've you've written about subjects that are not. I mean, this is not a straightforward biography, really. This is a you know this is a book about seduction, and it's got a lot of twists and turns in it. And your other books about seduction and women have been equally as um, as rich and very thick description wise. So how do you go about crafting these books, and what's your advice for? authors that want to replicate your work because of its richness? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I, I'm a research nut. I mean, I, I love that stuff. And, you know, uh, Henry James said it's when you're when you're writing, it's you're writing only the very tip of the iceberg. Below is massive, massive research. But you can't include it all, is the point. So I wanted narrative drive. I wanted to tell this as um, a story that was similar to, uh, to fiction, um, that used the same narrative devices as fiction. Because, and I didn't have to make up anything. That was the beauty of this particular book. I didn't have to invent dialogue. It was all in the court cases and everything was at my hand. But it was all a matter of, of, of building character and drama using the same techniques as fiction whenever I could. Because I think if you write a biography with long, dry uh, itemizations of of facts, where they went to school, what they did, and so on. I think you lose the reader. And I was very interested in making her um, appealing to the reader um, because that's the kind of person she was. I mean, she was a publicity diva. She wanted, she controlled her own narrative. And I wanted to control this narrative so that it was as as engaging and as interesting and as lively as her life was. So uh, it involved a lot of crafting and recrafting uh, and it involved a lot of reading out loud, I have to say, 
uh, to disinterested parties <laughs> who would tell me, oh, no, don't go there. We're not interested. You know, I know it's interesting to you because you did the research, but cut, cut, you know. So it's all about uh, finding the right details and the right and the and the and the right pace. Uh, I must say I had a lot of fun writing it though because it, it really fell into my hands. It wasn't as if I had to I had to manufacture drama at any point. I mean, life really reads like some R-rated melodrama. I mean, it's not something that it's stranger than fiction. I didn't have to with some biographies, I think you have to uh, gin it up all the time. I didn't have to do that. In in most cases, I had to sort of uh, down downplay certain episodes because it began to sound sort of over the top unless I was careful. Well, your your enjoyment in writing this is it. it I really enjoyed reading it. It, it. You know, it, so I think that experience for me of the melodrama and the uh, the escapades. There's there's not a whole lot of biographies that are like this, and the research in it is incredibly rich and detailed. We I can't thank you enough for for joining us to talk about it, and I would encourage everyone to go out and buy a copy and uh, and and read about this remarkable woman, uh, uh, Miriam Leslie. Well, thank you so much, Michael. It's been so much fun. I really appreciate your having me. Well, that's all we have time for. Thanks for listening. You can follow the Gilded Age and Progressive Era on Twitter or on my website, michaelpatrickcullinane.com. Please consider subscribing or reviewing the podcast wherever you listen because it really makes a big difference and helps direct others to the show. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode.